you. Honourable Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I had the luck and the um, blessing to be living in the Serengeti National Park for uh, a long time, and I don't think uh, Serengeti needs a lot of introduction. I still would like to show you a bit before I come and talk about some of the problems in conservation in Africa. The area is imprinted by the migration of one and a half million wildebeest and about 300 zebras, and they have an impact on everything in the system. Um, if you look at this picture uh, from the air, I haven't actually counted uh, the animals myself, but I think there in this one single picture, they are probably anything between 150 and 200,000 large mammals. One of the most impressive sites on this planet still. The migration follows the rains and the available food. And it's only because they actually migrate and use the whole resources in the ecosystem can they maintain such high numbers. They have, their, they have their calves out in the plains, in the Serengeti plains, which has actually um, uh, less rain. It's, not, um, it's a, a dry area, but it has very nutritious soil, and that's important when they're calving and uh, nourishing the calf. Then when the rain stops here, there is more rain that comes from out here, from uh, Lake Victoria, so they follow the rain and then they go up to the north into Kenya in the Mara Game Reserve where they spend uh, their uh, dry season. Here in the Mara is the only resource of water in the whole ecosystem. It's the Mara River that flows through the Mara Game Reserve and the Northern Serengeti National Park. Their number are being limited um, by the availability of food and water in this uh, dry season area. Serengeti is actually in a quite good shape today. There are probably three times as much animals in the Serengeti that there were 50 years ago. And uh, basically all of the whole migration system is under some kind of protection. The iconic, world-famous Serengeti has lots of superlatives. It's the lastest remaining large Angolan mi migration of these worlds. It has the highest number of large mammals, the highest number of different Angolan species, is the highest predator density, and foremost, it is a Tanzanian's national heritage. But even in paradise, uh, there are problems, and uh, today I would like to talk with you to some, uh, about some of the threats in the Serengeti National Park. That uh, is very much from my own perspective. Uh, one of the biggest threat is definitely human population growth. Then what we expecting and is coming, climate change. Uh, you have heard about poaching but a bigger threat is also development, infrastructure, and so on. Now, if you look at the world population and um, estimation how it changes, you can see that most areas in the world, most continents, are actually the population growth is slowing. In some areas like Switzerland or Japan, it's actually going down, um, but mostly it will be stable uh, in the next 50 years or so, except Africa. Africa, the prognosis, is still rising until the end of this century. So the result of it uh, is going to be that in 2050, the most of, by far most of the global increase in the human population is uh, coming from Africa. Um, um, Asia is still increasing somehow in, in the next 50 years, but other areas like Europe are actually already decreasing. So by the end of the century, 40% of the people of this planet will be African. And um, 
that is a huge, huge difference. That is, for Africa, two billion more people than today. In the Serengeti, you can see the, the national park is kind of in the center here. And in the Serengeti, you can see this kind of population pressure on the side, uh, on the western side of the park is already very dominant. You can see how uh, population increases a lot. Um, in the eastern side, we are quite lucky. This is a semi-desert area that is uh, used by uh, the Maasai, and they graze their cattle there. So there's less pressure from that side on the National Park. Just a month ago, the Zoological Society of London and WWF published figures that show that wildlife numbers in this whole planet have halved in the world in the last 40 years. And um, I show you just a small graph for the decline of the gravy zebra in Kenya, which is typical for that um, uh, species in Kenya and for other species as well, where you have an 80, 90 percent decrease. That is quite frightening. This is this is decrease in number. It's not it's not uh, a decrease in species, but of course, it means uh, human population. Growth comes with increased demand for food, demand for water, agriculture, for energy, uh, for wildlife projects. And with the decline uh, of numbers, uh, there is a danger for extension is increasing. So, two billion new citizens by 2050 the challenge for Africa countries are huge. I mean, they have to feed, educate, employ, house, provide sanitation, health, uh, lift them out of poverty. And besides these big, big challenges Africa is facing, we are telling them and we are hoping they can keep some of the world's amazing wilderness areas. But to achieve that, um, we must actually do quite a lot. But I think it is always uh, important, especially if you uh, work in conservation, that you keep an optimistic mind. And uh, there is uh, indications that uh, things are not going that badly, even so the numbers um, looked frightening. Um, in Tanzania, uh, there is 7% of the, its land area is protected as strict national parks, and a further 24% is also protected as a forest or game reserve. In addition, there is quite a lot of land still available, arable land that can be used for agriculture. But as I see it, uh, when it comes to protection, the most pressing and difficult uh, threat at the moment is uh, the, what we call the paper parks. You can see Tanzania has a, a lot of different protected areas. We know about the Serengeti, we know about Kilimanjaro, and we know about Ngorongoro, but the world doesn't actually know that there are huge areas in the west of the, uh, of the country. This is one of the most beautiful and most important wetland area in Africa, and they are not protected. There's no resources there, there is very little kind of inputs by the government, and they are already now overrun by people, by cattle, and if uh, we can't help uh, Tanzania to protect these areas, they will just vanish silently before the world even knows about them. There is also some uh, improvement in the um, health service, um, especially reproductive health service uh, is improved all over Africa, uh, but there is still limitation there because of tradition and uh, because of um, uh, money, because of organization that is slowing down uh, the, the process. 
Uh, I think it is uh, a, a very important to improve reproductive health service and improve and empower uh, the role of the women in the society because they make the decision about their families, they make the, uh, the ones that are using the natural resources, so they are the big decision makers of the future. The um, conservation education is in integrated into uh, most of uh, the teaching systems uh, these days in Africa. Uh, Tanzania National Parks has its own um, education unit even, and the government of Tanzania makes great strides to uh, educate new leaders of the future. They have actually achieved uh, to um, educate a lot more people, but because of the a uh, very fast uh, expansion of education, the standard has gone down. So uh, we, will, we need to make sure that universities, for example, are uh, coming up to international standards again so they can compete uh, with other countries and they can stand up when their resources are being threatened. The, um, Involvement of the local communities in conservation is uh, a very important issue and I think it has actually done a big strides in Africa and in Serengeti we have been going through different kind of stages and different kind of models and uh, one is uh, the um, wildlife management areas we call them where the government instead of keeping ownership of the animals they empower the communities to actually own these animals and to use them for tourism or hunting, but at the same time they have to be responsible for their protection and I think we believe that this is the model to help us in the future to protect some of this ecosystem. The Tanzanian government has made great strides in uh, training people, to, uh, in the anti-poaching force, in the law enforcement. Uh, they uh, have much better equipment and um, they are much better paid than they were before. But that is only really the, true for the few big well-known national park. The paper parks get basically nothing. Climate change. Africa is actually not producing much of uh, the causes of climate change, but they might become uh, the, uh, new, the biggest sufferer of climate change. But I think uh, that is really a planetary, uh, a planetary threat and it needs also uh, planetary solutions for it. We don't actually quite know yet what climate change would mean in a place like the Serengeti. Uh, we only know that weather uh, occurrence will be more erratic, there will be more storms and there will be longer uh, dry seasons. Um, in, uh, I have two scenarios which personally I think uh, can be quite frightening. One is if the Mara River, uh, which is in the north, which is the only source of water for these animals in the dry season, that is drying out more than six weeks, the uh, animals will die. And um, if once they are under about 200,000, they will not be able to recover anymore. The other uh, uh, scenario which um, climate change might bring is that the rainfall system, which is now kind of stationary or uh, which is followed by the migration, this whole rainfall system, if that shifts only, uh, 100 kilometers or so, the migration will not be able to follow and that would be the end of the migration as we see it today. The other biggest problem I think all of you have heard of is poaching and we distinguish with uh, meat poaching and uh, poaching for uh, trophies. Trophy poaching we mean elephant and uh, tusks and ivory horn. Both have dramatically increased in the uh, uh, last years. As long as the meat poaching is just for the pot of a family, it's not a real threat. 
And uh, we even estimate that in the Serengeti, nearly 100,000 uh, wildebeest are being uh, snared. But that is uh, the population of uh, one and a half million can actually bear that. And interesting enough, it is because the males are walking ahead of the females. So the males are being caught in the snares. Three quarters of all animals caught in snares are males. And we know males are not really necessary or only very free of us. So uh, that's why this whole population can actually sustain. That is a much more um, um, serious situation. Rhinos in the Serengeti were nearly poached out and uh, very, very slowly recovering at the moment. And uh, this kind of poaching is not sustainable. But it's also understandable if you look at uh, the price of gold, which I don't know when it was when I made that a few weeks ago, was about $42,000 per kilo. A rhino horn on the street in Vietnam is 65,000 kilo. Of course, this is not the price that goes to the poacher, but it's still a lot, a lot of money, many times the yearly salary of a poacher in the field. But of course, it's also a huge incentive for the whole kind of route from uh, the poacher to the networks that are trading it until the consumer. Um, just to show how dramatic uh, rhino uh, poaching has been increased in Africa in the last 10 years or so. The situation with the elephant is um, uh, practically the same. The poor animals have um, ivory that is actually uh, double the price of silver. And again, how can you stop uh, with a few rangers out in the field, somebody that uh, wants to uh, get this ivory uh, when they are so uh, valuable. We estimate that only last year alone, about 30,000 elephants were killed in Africa. Uh, for me personally, I, I started, when I started in the early 80s in, in the south of uh, the uh, um, Tanzania in the Salu Game Reserve, we counted from the air 110,000 elephants, and last time we counted there were 15,000. The situation in the Serengeti is a bit more complicated. We had uh, all time, there were not many uh, elephants in the Serengeti. Uh, then uh, the national park was created and they were better protected. And then the first poaching wave started here in the 70s, and uh, the population crashed to about 300 only. And then um, there was the CITES uh, ivory ban, which have really made a difference. And that was combined with uh, Operation Uhai, it was called. It was a military operation by uh, the um, Tanzanian government to protect and to uh, protect the parks and confiscate weapons. So if we want to solve the crisis in poaching, we need to eat in, in, in um, enforcement needs to be increased, especially in this, uh, what we call the paper parks, which have no protection at the moment. Uh, we have to target the smugglers and the initial sand syndicates. And of all, we have to educate the consumers because sometimes, as I think you said before, the consumer doesn't even connect the piece of ivory with a live elephant, they, 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 they cannot connect that anymore. And I think that is very important that we um, uh, connect them again. And I tell you, the end battle is, and the end victory is with the consumer. Because a few rangers in an area uh, as big as Hokkaido uh, cannot uh, protect all the rhinos and elephants there. But the consumer saying no, they can make a big difference. And they, uh, we have to make sure that they understand it's the consumer who decides whether there is elephant and rhinos in this world tomorrow. Other uh, issues is, um, of course, when um, I, even I came to uh, Tanzania, there were a lot less people living in that country. And uh, uh, that is increasing rapidly 
increasing people means more development is needed and uh, is welcome. And there, is, um, there was a plan for a commercial road through the Serengeti, and um, that was, it was clear we, uh, there was an area here, populated area, and an area on the other side. Somehow, these need to be uh, connected with a good road because people need to trade with each other. Uh, but this is where the uh, migration is in the, in the wet season, and this is where the dry season, and they pass back and forward. So it would have meant that um, uh, one and a half million wildebeest and 300,000 zebras would have gone up and down this road. And uh, of course, uh, that would have um, produced a lot of accidents because we were estimating a traffic from maybe uh, every uh, three minutes, um, uh, 10 trucks. So uh, that would have given accidents. When there's accidents, there's loss of equipment, there's loss of human life. Next one would have to be built um, a fence to uh, keep these accidents from happening, and that would have stopped the migration. And if they cannot go down to the Mara River, they will die in the, in the dry season, on the, and the um, um, migration, as we know, would be gone. But we found out that all this kind of um, 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 good conservation reasons, they're not enough to uh, con uh, convince uh, politicians. Uh, sorry, Mr. Minister. Ministers are much more, uh, politicians are looking to the next election period. Uh, it's very difficult to convince politicians with just conservation issues. So we found out that we have to actually look further than that. And we looked at uh, issues that were of interest to the people. So uh, it, uh, we uh, saw, well, if we just look at the villages, obviously a road going like this uh, it serves a lot more people than a road going through. So we started to look at a number of different um, socioeconomic impacts and for everything, whether it's human density, agriculture, livestock, economic activity, it made much more economic sense to build a road through the south of the Serengeti. And I think this uh, argument finally convinced the government of Tanzania and they agreed not to build a road through the national park. And when we are discussing about um, development uh, and conservation, I personally have the uh, feeling that it is very important that we are, as conservationists, we are realistic. We have to be pragmatic about things, and if there is justified um, uh, reasons for a road, we cannot just come up with another old elephant trail and say that's not possible. But we also need dialogue with the political side. We need a dialogue between conservation and with, between development. And we need to show that conservation can actually support uh, poverty ele elevation around protected areas. And I think we need also to be much more conscious and stand up and uh, come up uh, proactive early with our fears and our suggestions. So just shortly about the value of tourism in Tanzania. It's always a bit of a question whether this is um, the absolute wonderful uh, solution to everything or it's a Pandora box. Until now, um, tourism has been very beneficial for conservation in Tanzania. It uh, produces over a billion US dollar a year and uh, is the number one for example, even ahead of uh, minerals. Uh, it provides 70% um, of um, the GDP, even so you say it's not quite the right thing to uh, measure. Uh, it uh, uh, also uh, employs 700,000 people. But the in numbers of tourists has increased steadily. And uh, actually, we had uh, in uh, last year, we had 1.2 million arrivals in Tanzania. And the um, government would like to push that to 2 million. So there is a danger that too many 
tourists will actually destroy the resource. And in a way, it's actually not so much uh, from point of view of the ecology and the animal, it's much more how we as human beings can enjoy nature, you know. We, one line with 50 cars around is not what we would like when we go and be in the wilderness. Actually, up to now, uh, the, uh, the lion could not actually be bothered anyhow by you in a car. He, the lion hunts at night and in days is sleeping most of the time. And other species cannot just, like uh, cheetahs, have started to hunt when everybody is at lunch. So there's no tourist car going around. So, but it is for us also, mainly, that we want uh, not too many people around, so it's important that Tanzania is trying to maintain its low volume, high yield, low impact segment. Now, why, why wilderness? I mean, people can say, why is this all? Why don't we just garden the whole world? I mean, just want to go very shortly through it. It's basically the biodiversity of genes, species, and of landscapes that we are trying to maintain on this planet. It has very direct outcome of water and clean air. It's important for human health and well-being. It uh, provides employment. It's a refuge, not just for wildlife, but also for indigenous people. And it is a yardstick, so we can still measure how the world would be looking uh, without us as a species interfering everywhere. Then there is more kind of um, um, intrinsic values to it. Uh, I believe that as, as a human, we have also a moral obligation to be the stewards for all these uh, nameless and speechless creatures. And we have to um, protect nature because of a moral obligation. It has historical, cultural, and religious values, spiritual renewal, recreation, as you know here, and it's quite important for uh, in, um, education. One of the most important thing is that actually we need to keep this untouched wild lands and in all its diversity for the future generation. As my colleague has pointed out, it's, the, it's, it's not us that decide anymore, but this is something that belongs to the future. And if we can't keep it from them, our children, children, children have no chance to do it. For me, my only and my, my own vision is that in the future, the greatness of a nation will not be judged by its advance in technology or by its achievements in architecture, art or sports, but by the amount of nature and biodiversity that it can hand over to the next generation. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.